So Philippians 2, uh, we're in a book all about, the theme of this book is about choosing joy. And it's a choice every day of our life to choose. Choose you this day whom you will serve. The Old Testament uh, heard the Moses as he spoke to the people. And that's a decision we need to make. We either choose our circumstances or we choose Christ. We either choose to serve ourselves or we serve the Lord Jesus. When we choose the Lord and we choose to serve and love others, we have joy. When we choose ourselves, we, we stay in that, that sense of misery. And uh, the scripture gives us how to have joy. It's a choice. It's a decision every day. The Apostle Paul is saying this by experience. He's in a Roman prison cell. He's locked up beside a soldier. He's there 24 hours a day. And he can choose either to take his uh, circumstances and complain about it. Even what others are saying about him and, and worry about it. Or he can take the opportunity and further the gospel and find some joy in the circumstances that he is in. So the Apostle Paul says, in a sense, it's a survival guide in times of trials. He says, here's how I choose joy. That's what he's saying in Philippians. He says, I, I choose it with a singleness of mind to focus my mind on the faith, the fellowship, and the furtherance of the gospel. And if everything has a gospel purpose in your life, you will find joy. That's choosing joy. And now he moves it even further and says, you must have a, a submissive mind. So he speaks of singleness of mind, focusing your mind. And then now he's saying to, to serve and make decisions that result in actions of obedience and humility. And the greatest example that we saw last week was the Lord Jesus. How he humbled himself. It became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And humility is not a weakness. Uh, humility is meekness, meaning strength under control. Uh, he was able to let go of his reputation, to let go of his rights to redeem you and me. Amen? And the Bible says that everything and everyone that he humbled himself to and for will one day confess and declare that he is Lord. You have to trust God to live in a life of submission. Jesus did as he was obedient to the Lord's command. So in chapter 2, he's already appealed for unity, verses 1 through 4. He has appealed to humility in verses 5 through 11. Now he moves to our responsibility. The passage you heard for our scripture reading follows that example of the Lord Jesus. And verse 12 starts with a wherefore. Someone said, when you see a therefore or a wherefore, you should see what it's there for. And so it's a look back and an invitation to follow and an application to obey. And the application is this today. Because of who Jesus is and because of what Jesus has done, we're going to ask and answer that question that the philosopher, theologian Francis Schaeffer posed in his book. I recommend that book. How should we then live? How should we then live? Schaeffer makes the point that if the Bible is the bedrock of society, there's success. I'll take this a little further. If Jesus and his word is central to your life, you'll have joy. Yes. You'll have success. If Jesus humbled himself, if Jesus was obedient for the joy that was set before him, if Jesus was able to trust his heavenly father and obey and watch and wait until God worked it all out, what should we do? How should we then live? Look at verse number 12. Wherefore, my beloved. Now I like how Paul doesn't say, wherefore, you backslidden believers. Or wherefore, you people who really can't figure it out. He says, I love you. I'm letting you know this because I love you. Wherefore, those that I love, as you have always obeyed. See how he compliments them. And not as in my presence only. Now he projects upon them. But now much more in my absence. This is good parenting lessons here as well. He says, you've obeyed me. The word there is listened with intent. You've heard me. And you've did it in my presence and now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now what does that mean? For us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. How should we then live? 
I believe that this question, how we should then live, and working out our own salvation with fear and trembling is, is something that involves a participation. It's a responsibility. And we'll say this, number one, we are to participate in our own spiritual growth. We are to participate in our own spiritual growth. We're to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. This is our responsibility. This is your responsibility. You give an account for your life. You give an account for your growth. It's my responsibility to focus on my growth and my relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, we often like to look at others and compare ourselves among ourselves. And the Bible says those that do that are not wise. We often like to shirk responsibility and say, what about their growth? What about their life? The Lord's not looking at them. He's looking at you today. I think of the Twinkie defense. Have you heard of that? John Hinckley, maybe some attorneys can help us out with this. And when he attempted to assassinate uh, President Reagan, uh, blamed his ongoing depression uh, and insanity. But he used, he said it was compounded by a excessive uh, eating of Twinkies. Now, I don't know about you, but Twinkies make you happy, not hurt people. <laughs> it's not Twinkies. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It didn't work. Just as you'll never outrun your shadow, you'll never outrun your God-given responsibility. Paul says, whether I'm present or absent, even much more so when I'm absent. Why? Because it's not my presence around you. It's the spirit within you. Work out your own salvation. A mark of maturity is when a child can be trusted to be left alone. We still need babysitters. If you want to volunteer for that, we've got some wonderful ones here today. My parents and Anna's with us today. And so we love babysitters, but uh, you know, we still need them. I mean, there may come a time when our children are mature enough uh, to need some babysitters. Uh, I old this is, is about there. He's there, but uh, we still need to check up on check up on them. Why? Uh, because they're still in need of maturity. When they can be fully left alone, we would say they are mature. This past week, you may have seen what happens when Messy Jesse, that's our nickname for him, gets left alone. He cracked all of the eggs, all 18 of them. There's proof. It was an improvement of two weeks ago when he cracked his head. So we'll, we'll take the eggs. This afternoon, I need to rent a carpet cleaner from a store, PetSmart, because of what happens when Messy Jesse is left alone. Just imagine what 18 eggs smell like when smeared into the carpet. You don't have to imagine, just come by the house and take a whiff. But what, what do you do when you're left alone? That's Paul's point. Christianity is not what others think about you. It's who's within you. It's amazing how many brake lights flash when we see a patrol car. And I said we. Have you ever figured this out? They're smart. There's a few patrol cars around town that just, are just parked there. And even if I know it's been there, there's nobody in there, we slam on our brakes anyways. Now some of y'all are in the spirit and y'all are at the level of sanctification I'm not at yet. You're like, I'm fine. You know you're doing wrong when you have to slam on the brakes. But why do we slam on the brakes? I, mean, I get nervous every time I see a Dodge Charger. We do that because we're reminded of a presence. That's Paul's point. Heard of someone who wanted to slow traffic and so they pulled out a hairdryer and just sat in the side of the road. I, I may try that on Chelsea Drive. The word Paul uses here is action while I'm absent. The obeyed is listening. In fact, it's used in Greek literature of someone who answers the door. So if the doorbell rings, you answer it. You act as a result of hearing or listening. He said, you did it in my absence when I was with you. You listened to me. But now when I'm absent, you should do it even more so. Friend, today, it's been said that a growing reputation is based on how you act when people are watching. But a growing sanctification is how you act when nobody's watching. 
As we mature in our sanctification, the pressure of the presence of the Spirit of God, it moves from an external authority, an influence, to an internal authority of the Holy Spirit. Do you see what he says? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's Old Testament terminology. Remember Moses as he stood there before the burning bush and the Lord said, take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. When you get for the presence of the Lord at Sinai, they stood there with fear and with trembling and we're to live our life and we're to serve the Lord in such a way as if we are right in the presence of God. We don't just slam on the brakes when the police officers are watching. We obey God. We obey God in the circumstances of life. That's maturity. You don't have to be followed up on. You don't need a call from this person or that person. You don't need to check up on. You're serving God in obedience to his will and to his way. It says work out your own salvation. Now lest you get confused, it does not say work for your salvation. It does not say work up your salvation. It doesn't say work toward your salvation. It says what? Work out your salvation. He's not talking about a salvation that is a work salvation, but he is talking about a salvation that works. You're not saved by works. You're saved, as Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 says, you're by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But the next verse says that we are created unto, we his workmanship, created by him unto good works. We're not saved by works, but if we're saved, it ought to work. There ought to be a change. It's not just something external. There's an internal drive and desire to know God. That's our theme this year. To know him. Hey, it shouldn't be me going rah-rah and standing up and saying, know the Lord, do your devotions and pray and be in house of God. That shouldn't be the case. Now, sometimes you need that. As children, as we're growing in Christ, we need some discipleship. We need some correction. We need some guidance. And I need provoking in my spiritual life. But listen, there is someone and something within me that says, go there, do that. Give that gospel track. Get in my word. I want to know you and you want to know him to work out. You can't work out your body unless you're physically alive. And you can't work out your salvation until you're spiritually alive. The word work out were were your words used in this time for mining. Think of a prospector. A prospector owns a gold mine, but he needs to mine out. He needs to work out what is down deep within to get the gold out. Charles Spurgeon saw this passage and he said, I am to mine what is mine. It's yours, God has given it to you, but you have to go down deep and work it out. Work out your own salvation. Now it's important to note that salvation is not just salvation from hell someday. Salvation is three parts. We're saved in the past from the penalty of sin. That's our justification. We're saved in the future from the presence of sin. That's our glorification. But right now you are being saved. You are being saved in the presence from the power of sin. From the power of sin. And what's that called? Sanctification. That's what he's speaking about. As you're growing in Christ, we are positionally, perfectly sanctified in his presence. But right now, we are progressively being sanctified. Surrendering to him. Growing in him. Being obedient to him. So it doesn't matter if somebody's watching or looking. We're making efforts. We're working it out making progress towards completing the goal. What is the goal? Philippians 3, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, forgetting the things which are behind, pressing on to the mark for the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. What is that prize? One day we will be like and with the Lord Jesus Christ. Particularly, we'll be like Jesus. It's called Christ-likeness. Hey, David says this, I shall awake and I shall be satisfied when I awake in thy likeness. Praise God. Listen, this is the point and purpose of our Christian life, that we are to live in such a way to do our part. To demonstrate the humility of Christ. To be obedient to the will of the Father. Why? Wherefore? Jesus did that. He humbled himself. He became obedient unto death. He made himself of no reputation. 
He died for us. What can we do for him? How shall we then live? We must participate in spiritual growth. Number two, look at verse number 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. We are to participate in spiritual growth. Get this down. Number two, we are to anticipate spiritual strength. Look at the word for work here. For God worketh in you. It's the word for energeia. It's the word we have our word for energy. We can work out what God has worked in because God is working in me. Now, let me tell you, friend, you get into the epistles. Some people say, oh, I just like the Old Testament stories. That's all fun and good and great. We're going to be there tonight. But I'm telling you, digging down deep into the doctrine of God's word, when you begin to understand what God's saying, it absolutely blows your mind because here's what God's saying. By the way, Ephesians, we're in him. He's in us. We're up there. He's down here. It doesn't make sense. That's another paradox in the text. Look at this. You are working, but it's not you working. It's God working in you. How does that make sense? Will you tell me about the Trinity and figure that out and we'll go into this? It doesn't. But God says it. You see, human responsibility, divine ability or sovereignty, inextricably woven together, but they're truths, side by side, truths that are completely true. It's our responsibility, but understand, ultimately it's, it's his ability. His ability. Think of it this way. Every, behind every command is the omnipotent power of God to carry out that command. Amen. So God says do it. It's not you doing it. It's you stepping out in obedience to it, but it's God that's doing it through you. That's the Christ life. We do our part. He does his part, but it's all him. We just need to anticipate spiritual strength. This is encouragement for you. God tells you to do it. God tells you to be sanctified. God tells you to be holy even as he is holy. God tells you to surrender from sin and serve him and obey him. And you say, I can't do it. You're right. But he can and you can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You watch Philippians 4 come together with all this. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. What's the all things? Praising him, choosing joy despite the circumstance. That's the context of it. Choosing obedience, following him. I can do all things. It's a little bit like, if you think about it, it's, God, it's God's work. You're working. It's like a power steering in an automobile, okay? The power steering is there, but you've got to move the wheel. When you move the wheel, the power steering takes over. I don't know much about cars. I'll have to ask many of you if I got that right. But I think it's close. It reminds me of the man who wanted a raise and he thought he was going to get a raise and he didn't get a raise at his job. And he went to his employer and said, so when does my raise become effective? The boss said, when you do. do it. This is responsibility and God's ability. We are commanded, stick with me this morning, to work outwardly. But when we're working outwardly, it's a result of God working inwardly. Come on now. When I, when I, when I connected him, I started studying this out, and I wish I communicate, communicate it better because it brought a great peace and joy to say, I can serve him. I can live for him. I can love him. I can submit to him. I can focus on him. I can find joy when I take steps of obedience and trust and humility because it's never been me. It's God working in me, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Both the desire comes from God and the doing comes from God. To will, it's his will. And when your will gets aligned with his will, things begin to take off. It's his doing. When you begin to do what God wants you to do, it begins to take off. And you, we can't explain it, but it's God working in us. Christ, the hope of glory, his ability, omnipotence Amen. in us. Working to do what he's called us to do. Hallelujah. That gives me some hope that I can step out and serve him in obedience. God isn't going to make you to open up your Bible and study it. Ooh, wouldn't that be great? Wake up in the morning. You'd be a robot. God's not going to make you get on your knees and pray. Now, he may bring situations in your life to drive you to your knees. The only place you can look is up. He isn't going to drive you to church. Wouldn't that be nice? This is going to transport you miraculously to choir practice or volunteer in the nursery. Can't pray those diapers away. <laughs> he isn't going to make you save money and give it to missions. He isn't going to make you testify of his grace to your neighbors. But he will work in us, his work in us, 
can help us work out for him. It does not eliminate our responsibility to him. But when we do work, it's through his energizing strength to do what's right. It doesn't make it easier. It doesn't make obedience easy, but it does make it possible. And when we desire to act, we understand it was first his desire. When we accomplish it, it was for his good pleasure and for his glory. It's humbling. Here's our response. Here's how it should be. How did you do that? Answer, God did it through me. How did you come up with that idea? God put it on my heart. Where did you get that desire from and drive from? God gave it to me. You say, well, there it is. It's all God. I'm waiting for that desire. I just don't have a desire. And when the sovereign God of the universe gives me a desire, then I will go do it. Now, you're just holding yourself. Because if you don't have a desire to know God, if you don't have a desire to be like Jesus, you're either not saved or seriously backslidden. Either way, you need God to step in and even work even more powerfully in your life. You say, I don't have that desire. Well, then you just invite God to work in your life. You, you say, I don't have that drive. You invite God to work in your life. One preacher prayed it like this. Lord, help us to cooperate with you so you don't have to operate on us. I choose to cooperate before he has to operate. Look at verses 14 and 15. You say, preacher, I'm in. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to do what God has called me to do. All right? Let's take a look. Verse number 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. I looked it up in the Greek. Literally, it says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Now, in my revised version, I would prefer it to say this. Do most things without murmurings and disputings. Do do some things without murmurings and disputings. Try your best not to do some. Do all, all means all, and that's all all means. Murmurings and disputings. See, we're to participate in our spiritual growth. We're to anticipate spiritual strength. Number three, get this, we're to separate from unscriptural, unspiritual rather, attitudes and actions. It's a decision. Well, I just can't help it. Yes, you can. It's a choice. Murmurings is what is emotionally respond, is your emotional response. Disputings is your intellectual response. And it's not of God. Murmurings is a half concealed, half uttered complaint against God or others. Murmurings was a sin of those who had no joy in the Old Testament when they wandered around in the wilderness and they missed the promised land. Don't miss out on God's promised land for your life because you're muttering complaints against God or others. They wandered in the wilderness of unbelief and they murmured and they heard not God. Murmurings lead to disputings. Two willy monsters that hold back your joy. Murmuring and disputing. Murmuring is is and sounds like it is. It's just a, a, a quiet sort of statement, a lack of obedient humility. It's just a complaint. It's an emotional complaint. Well, I don't, I don't know about that. I don't know about this. I heard of a survey taken by Gallup to determine how content people were where they lived. They targeted people relative to the state where they lived and they were interested if they would move. The shocking results show that nearly half of the respondents said they wanted to live in another state in the country. They complained about their state. I don't know what there's to complain about in North Carolina, but um, you'll find something. And Gallup had another, another question. How likely would you be to move? 73% said never. In other words, Gallup summarized, it appeared that many of us would rather complain about where we live than actually move somewhere else. Because of our fallen nature, we happen to like to live in a state of discontent. We like to complain. Someone said, the Lord created the world in six days, rested on the seventh and on the eighth, began to take complaints. He says, do all things without murmurings or disputings. All all, all. That's what it means to be like Jesus. Jesus went to the cross. He suffered on Calvary. He went to his death. He opened not his mouth. Didn't say a word. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter because he loved us. All things without murmurings and disputings. Why? That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights 
unto the world. Blameless means nothing sticks. It speaks about a quality, a product, blameless. As a believer, we ought to live lives of blameless integrity. Harmless refers to our purity. I think about when I talked to the family last night about, about Larry Sullivan. You know, nobody was perfect. But you understand, in the 13 years I've been here, and I can't say this about some folks, but I, I never heard a complaint from him directed to me. Now, it may be out there. Don't tell me about it. But he, he never complained. He was somebody that had just a hu- humble, heartfelt spirit. It doesn't mean he ever never spoke truth. It doesn't mean he ever said anything directly. It doesn't mean he ever pointed something out. But he had love. And he didn't have a spirit. It was interesting because I've experienced that personally. And I was talking to the family and they were talking about how they never saw anything either. And the son-in-law said, you know, one time we're out back and I thought he was about to lose it. The chainsaw didn't start, didn't work. And he was cranking on the chainsaw and he said he was about to lose it. And he said, about, about, he said let's, just, let's just go inside and get a glass of water. You know, sometimes in the stresses and messes of life, We just need to go inside and get a glass of water, water of the word of God, water of time refreshing and just get away and get serving. And this is what blameless and harmless means because people are watching. They said, live your life in such a way where the preacher doesn't have to lie at your funeral. And what a truth that's, that's been. Do you see this? Holding forth the word of life, lights in a dark world, rejoicing in the day of Christ. That you've not run in vain or labored in vain. You're living for an audience of one. When I stand one day and I give an account, yes, as a preacher, as a teacher of the gospel, I give an account for your souls. That's a, that is a high and holy responsibility. You give an account for those that you've witnessed to or haven't witnessed to. You give an account for those around you. But the greatest account that you give for, for is your life. You'll give an account for your life and you're standing before Jesus Christ and there is no excuses. You can't say, well, that person or this person or here's what they did to me or here's what happened. No, it's you and Jesus alone as you stand before the judgment seat of Jesus. If Christ were to come back today, if you were to come back right now, is there anything in your life you'd be ashamed of? Is there anything that you would want to change? Friend today, whatever came into your mind, that has taken away your blamelessness and harmlessness. You need to surrender it to Jesus and he will give you the desire. He will give you the drive. He will give you the ability to obey and be humble even unto death. Praise God for his grace. Praise God for his ability. Praise God for his purity. Praise God for what he's doing for us. And we just need to hold forth the word of life that we may rejoice in that day. Verse 17. Finally, he says, yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. We're connected here. We're connected here. We're to participate in our spiritual growth. We're to anticipate spiritual strength. We're to separate from unspiritual attitudes and actions. Finally, we're to consecrate ourselves to spiritual service. I think of what Paul says in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves and your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You realize there's a lost and dying world. And they expect Christians to act like Christians. They expect not just your outer actions, not just your standards, but something down deep within you. That when a trouble comes and a trial comes, you're not murmuring. You're not complaining against God. You've got a joy unspeakable and full of glory. Like the choir sang when you're locked up at midnight and you're in a Philippian prison cell. You're praising him and singing to him. Why? Because God likes to hear you sing. And there's a suicidal jailer on the other side seeing and listening to what you're singing and saying and when the trouble comes and when God sets you free that's when they're going to come to you and say what do you have sirs what must I do to be saved that's what happened at Philippi if I had been beaten and locked up at prison I might have been complaining angry upset but Paul and Silas sang praises to God and had a joy unspeakable and full of glory and as they did their part to praise God God did his part to set them free I think we're sawing, try to sawing out of the prisons of life with hacksaws. When God says, I've given you the way of escape, and that's a hope that's within you, and that's a praise that comes without through you. So we just surrender. Easy said or easier said and done. I can preach that behind a pulpit on Sunday, but it's a surrender to say, God, you're in control. It's a sacrifice. And as I sacrifice, Paul says, when you serve and you sacrifice, it's like the Old Testament offerings when they were mixed upon the altar. The drink offering, the burnt offering. 
I get a blessing out of your service. I get a blessing out of your sacrifice. Do you realize that if you, have, if you choose joy, somebody else around you is going to choose joy. Yeah. Misery loves company. Oh, yeah. But if somebody's got the joy of the Lord, it begins to spread. And he's in prison. He's locked up. And he says, I need you to have joy. And I'm having joy for you. You need to have joy for me. We can joy together as we sacrifice and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. We should live humbly, holy, proclaiming the gospel joyfully. Uh, I wasn't necessarily going to share this, but I, I felt led to share it. And maybe we'll take it off the radio. And hopefully you won't check on it. The person's not here. But I heard yesterday as we we're sitting talking about soul winning and opportunities, uh, a couple that stormed the church mentioned they were out visiting and they passed out tracks and they came across somebody in town and they gave him a gospel track for our church, Tabernacle Baptist Church. And the lady looked at it and she said, and as he was talking, he said, you know, it was somebody that was your neighbor. And at first I'm like, oh boy, no. That didn't, I didn't really have any concern about it. I know my neighbors and love my neighbors. And, but he said this, they looked at the track and they said, I know that church. I know that pastor. I live two doors down. You know what could have been said? Yeah, you know, they're horrible people. Now, if they've done this, they've done that. You know what they told that couple? They told them a story that's probably the weirdest story ever. And it kind of just passed my mind. But our dog, our former dog, I must say, we found another home for him. Jack has been rehomed. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We got a hamster instead. A hamster named Muffins. Jack can run free. Jack broke out of the fence. This is one of his many indiscretions. He went over to the neighbor's yard and tore up their sod. Completely tore it up. I don't know what's in there, but something got him all excited and tore up the, the yard and the sod and the grass. And They came to find me and they had left something. I didn't get it, but they came and left and she pulled across and she said, you know, your dog tore up our yard. You in the flesh, I could have said, prove it. I didn't. I just said, oh, yeah, really? It's surprising. And she said, as if she was expecting me to say prove it, she said, we have a ring proof. It's on camera. I could have said, that could have been any golden retriever. Did you have DNA testing? Do you have levels of, was there an eyewitness? Talk to my lawyer, Lewis King. He'll take care of you. I didn't say that. Now, if I was in the, it's a choice. I, in the flesh, could have done all that. This is not to brag on me at all because you can probably get 15 different bad stories to share with you. <laughs> Brother Hauser, did she share any of that with you? <laughs> I asked her, the Spirit of God arrested my attention. I said, ask her how much it would have cost. And I asked her how much it would have cost and she said it, the price. And immediately took care of it and added more on top of it. God very poignantly reminded me each and every day. Now, yesterday I wasn't so nice at most, so don't be, don't think I'm arrived spiritually yet. It's not my fault they have false advertising, but <laughs> each and every moment of each and every day, you have a choice. Yes. Choose you this day whom you will serve. To, to participate in our sanctification is to choose to be like you or choose to be like Jesus. To anticipate his spiritual strength is to obey him no matter what. Step out in faith and watch him take you the rest of the way. Yes. To be a part of his blessing of living for him and holding forth the truth and saying no to sin and having that decision to say no to unspiritual attitudes and actions is to say, I won't murmur. I won't dispute. I'm going to step out and serve and surrender myself to Jesus Christ and trust him every step of the way. It brings you joy. It brings me joy. It brings us joy. Now, I understand this is a message for believers today, but if you're here without Jesus Christ, you say today, I have no desire to know God. I've had no desire to live for him. I'm living secret, sinful lives. Friend, today, if you're living a life of sin and it doesn't bother you, you probably, the Bible says, you are, and there's no chastisement, there's no conviction, you've got no, if there's no dealing with God about your sin or situation or service or spirit, you ought to see whether or not you're saved and whether or not you really need to be revived in him today. If you're backslidden, if you're unsaved today, come to Christ. He'll take out that old heart of stone and put in you a heart of flesh. Would you do that today? Just come to him. If you're saved today, say, I'm, I'm going to continue in the program. 
That's the message of Philippians. To know him, to make him known, is a daily decision and surrender to trust him no matter what.